Good morning, Wiley. Thank you very much indeed for having me back over to your amazing collection of tiger cubs. I would be most grateful if you could maybe share a few words about this collection. You bet, Mike. I'd be very happy to do that. I became really excited about Triumph Tiger Cubs in about 1961, and I was riding them an awful lot down in the Tillamook Burn with many of my friends at that window of time from 61 on through 74 and 5. But if I back up just a little bit, I was hired by the Triumph arm of Johnson Motors out of Duarte, California. And in 1969, Johnson Motors hired me to be a Northwest representative for Triumph motorcycles. Within 10 days after being hired, I was then sent to England and I went to the Coventry factory where the Triumph Bonnevilles were uh, produced and manufactured. And then they took me on a high-rise bus and I went up to Birmingham, England. Then I went through the BSA factory there. Anyway, I've been riding motorcycles ever since 1948. And my first motorcycle was a Mustang motorcycle called a Mustang Colt, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> I started this Triumph Tiger Cub collection. I have everything from 1957 through 1967, and I have a total of 13 Triumph Tiger Cubs. The first year they ever came out with a swinging arm was in 1957, and they had the 200cc bike, but they had the ignition coil. And then in 63, they came out with the ET ignition or the side point ignition. And so I have this 57 that started off with just a little carburetor and an ignition coil and a little round barrel, and it has the nacelle headlights. Then uh, the 57, 8s, and 9s were uh, virtually identical. Then in 60 and 61, they changed the forks and they became a little teeny bit more robust and a little bit stronger front end fork assembly. So I have representation here of, of 57s to 63s, 64, 65s, and 67s. Probably one of the nicest motorcycles that I enjoyed was the 65. 66 and 67s. The reason for that is they came out with what they referred to as a square barrel and they had a very good front fork assemblies. They were almost like the Triumph 500 cc front fork assemblies and the ignition system and wide ratio gearboxes and so they worked wonderfully well for me. We called them the Triumph Tiger Mountain Cubs, and they had the yellow tanks, and so they were very recognizable. In my opinion, it was the ideal motorcycle to own during that window of time, and uh, so uh, that, that was typically my favorite bike. The street bikes in a 65, I have one of those also, and it, it has the low exhaust system on it. So they called it an SS model. And then in 66 and 67, which were again virtually identical in the last year of 67, and they had the orange tanks. This is the way we would strip down the 65s. We would strip them down and run an alloy fender or a Preston Petty plastic fenders. And then we'd take the headlight off and all the electrical for the headlights or a horn, we would take that off we would lighten it up as best we could. We would typically install a short seat like that right there. And then uh, instead of having a muffler, we would run a straight pipe or a very, very light muffler to it so that it would give us a maximum horsepower that it would be possible. And so we would typically just strip them down and only have on there what's necessary. The colors are just so vibrant though, aren't they as well? The beautiful colors like this blue one here uh -huh. and that green one there in the middle and <laughs> the oranges, they're just gorgeous colors, aren't they? Yeah. Well, we have the two. We have the two bikes. We have this one right here, and this one right here. 
and these were 65s. What's unique about, and I forgot to mention, that it has a different Kickstarter. It flips out, and if I can reach my hand in there, I can show you this. Oh, yes. This articulates, that Kickstarter uh, articulates and kicks out, and then uh, when you get your bike started, then it will fold back. But they only did it one year, and that was 65 only. And then they fold up real nice and tight against the engine. And to reiterate, the 59s had uh, 200 cc's, and, and from 57 through 67, they maintained that 200 cc's. However, with the 57, they had a little round barrel. And then in 61, they came out with an oval barrel. And then in 1965, they came out with a square barrel, which is why I always favored the 65, because it had the square barrel, and it had the uh, flip-out kickstarter, and then they have a heavy-duty front fork assembly. That is probably the reason why I kind of favored the 65 model of all the years that I did ride 61s and 2s and 3s because I would trade with Cycle Hub and I became extremely good friends with Cliff Major. I always bought a brand new motorcycle every year from 61 through 67. So I've, I've ridden every one of those models. Wow. So was it, he was the triumph dealer in Portland that, oh, at yes, that time? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. He was the man. Were they just flying out of the door back then? then? Oh, absolutely. Isn't it amazing? Yes. But what a sight it must have been seeing those yeah. bikes in, the, in that day. These are some of the 1957 motorcycles right here. These two right here. They, again, represent some of the finest motorcycles and the Cubs that were ever built. That was again through that era of 57 to 67. And so I had an awful lot of fun riding these things in the Tillamook Burn and in the hills and the trails. And uh, even though I had a Triumph Bonneville, I always kept the Bonneville more for road use. And uh, I just, the Triumph Tiger Cubs work extremely well for me. Were they so, really popular back then? I mean, did they sell a lot of them? Johnson Motors was selling every bike they could get a hold of when these Triumph Mountain Cubs came out. And so uh, they were two of them in a crate. They came in from Coventry, England. Like I said, I've bought some of these old brand spanking new and uh, I hope you enjoy the collection. They're such pretty bikes, aren't they, Wiley? Well, I think so. <laughs> They're lovely, aren't they? They're very sort of... I know they were a robust yeah. bike, but they look quite well, they, pretty, don't they? Yeah, that's exactly the way I th thought and feel, and I even feel that today. The, yeah. They're just so clean and neat. What's on there is needed and necessary. Yeah. And, uh, they're almost like jewelry, aren't they? You know, the, well, to the me components. they are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, did you always intend to keep going or did you just buy one and then it just snowballed from oh, there? Oh yeah, right, yes. I, I had no idea I, I was going to do what I did. <laughs> How long did it actually take you to restore all of these bikes then? Did you have several restorations going on at the same time or did you do them sequentially one after another? Yeah, well that's a, a multiple questions but uh, <laughs> typically it would take eight months to a year almost because sometimes the parts, bits and pieces were extremely hard to find. Eight out of these 13 bikes have totally restored. Every nut and bolt came apart. The wheels, the hub assemblies, the spokes, the bearings, the engine tore completely down every nut and bolt and then totally reassembled. And so uh, occasionally would run across a difficulty of trying to find a part. Again, Mike, thank you very much for coming over and... Uh, thank you, Wiley. It was my pleasure, it really was. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I come back and ask you a little bit more about your time with Johnson Motors? Certainly, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. I'm sure the guys would love okay. to you, hear more about your, your time with Triumph and Johnson you, Motors. You're welcome to do that, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. 
All right. Okay. And thank you again. Yeah, thank you.